glorify you and thank you for the light that reflected on them, Father God. That we be the salt shaker of the earth, Father God, walking around salting all those that are around us, giving them some flavor, Father God. That someone may come amongst them and see the, sm the sweet smell and aroma of them, Father God, that can only come from Jesus Christ. Have your way in this place, Father God. That we may be on one accord for your glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. Amen. Paul says, I determined to come before you not know anything else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. As we continue our lesson from Paul, given to him by the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, I think back and remind us that when Paul first wrote this letter, the reason he wrote this letter started off, one, because they were his children, given to him by God as believers, a God's children, given to Paul as he preached the gospel and he started the church in Corinth. But as he came across some news that he understood or got from Chloe's house, the reason he sent this letter was again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 where it says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Paul wrote this letter because he understood and heard and was told about the divisions within the church. Was we know and as we've been learning as mature Christians that I know that you to be that have been taught and the word tells us is that God desires unity unity in the body unity in the spirit unity in the truth when we have divisions all believers are affected when it occurs it can cause pain or suffering and loss of faith in the mature believers it can cause false belief in new believers it can cause devastation on pastors and their families and bring blame upon the name of Jesus Christ. But we know even though there's divisions, and the word tells us that there's divisions, and those divisions are against God, but one thing that will always happen or continue to happen is debates. Debates will occur. People will argue for and against their beliefs or others. Disputes will continue to happen because of spiritual immaturity, a lack of knowledge and understanding, or misinterpreting scriptures. Jesus himself had debates and arguments over the scriptures at many times when he went throughout the Galilee on his ministry that God had placed him for over three years as he was teaching and showing the disciples he came across many folks believers non-believers Pharisees Sadducees the scribes the Roman God the, uh, 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 Pontius Pilate Herod but Jesus was always given an answer it became debates sometimes arguments the word tells us that we should be always ready to give an answer, to defend the truth. So although there are divisions and those divisions against God, but we have to recognize there's going to be disagreements, especially when it comes to the word of God. But let's share in a common bond to understand that God delivers the truth to us. The truth is available, and through the Holy Spirit, as we understand the truth, or God enlightens our mind to understand the truth, it's that common bond that should bring us together. Divisions are usually separate, separate us when it's uh, 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 false doctrines, worldly wisdom, yielding to our own desires. But a lack of understanding or knowledge is always there, and sometimes it's shown in debates. Turn with me to, hold your finger there, but turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and we look at one such instance where Jesus was debating with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Again, it's the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and we'll be reading verses 34 through 40. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. And you all have it, say amen. Amen. Still hear some pages flipping. One more time, Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. And the word says as such, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest com great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. According to scripture, Jesus in verse 23, as Jesus was having this, this disagreement, this debate with the Sadducees, according to verse 23, it says, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection question Jesus about what happens if a woman who is married and her husband dies. They say by law she is to marry her departed husband, husband's brother. And in the hyper, they were asking a hypothetical question. If this happens seven more times, if that brother, she, the husband she was married to died, and she marries his brother and he dies, then marry the next brother and he dies, all the way up to the seventh brother, during the resurrection, who would a wife be with? Now, according to verse 23, the first thing it says, the scripture tells us that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, but yet they asked Jesus this hypothetical question. Jesus answers and says, they were mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. Scripture also says, when the Pharisees heard how Jesus silenced the Sadducees, they again tested him, this time by a lawyer, questioning him about the law, which is one of the, which is one of the greatest commandments there. Now again, they're testing Jesus and their knowledge and his knowledge and understanding. This time they bring a lawyer, and you know a lawyer is trained to debate. A lawyer is trained to ask questions, especially with someone on trial, trained to find answers. So I tested them and they give this lawyer, ask the question, which is the greatest commandment of all? Well, here's Jesus as he's engaged in a public debate with these Pharisees and Sadducees, two Jewish factions that opposed him and his teachings. And Jesus knew this, knowing all things. Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. According to Jesus, this is the first and great commandment. Well, almost all of the New Testament references to love are from the Greek words agapio or agape. And that word agape, which means unconditional love, is one of God's attributes. This is the Christian love in the Bible. When you see the word, most time when they talk about love and they're talking about believers, they're talking about this agape love, unconditional, unrestricted. It's God's attribute. It's why God was able to send his only begotten son for you and I, in spite of who we were, in spite of well conditioning, send a son to die for us. Because God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This love is an unconditional love. God loved us so much in spite of who we were. He sent his son to die on Calvary's cross for us. Jesus Christ loving us and loving his father. Agape love, unconditional Although he knew he would be beaten and tortured. Although he, though he knew the trials and tribulations he would go through. Although he left his father's side and came down here on earth and humbled himself as a man, a lonely servant. But his love for the father, unconditional love. He understood the will of the father. Well, if this is the first and greatest commandment according to Jesus Christ. To love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Are we giving our best? God wants it all. Meditate on that. Look at that word. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the God, your God. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. God wants it all. I believe there's a song out there singing. I don't want to sit here singing because I messed the words up. But I just remember that choir part. God wants it all. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how that is because when we think about ourselves and how much we want, you know, sometimes we can want a lot. Sometimes we can want the wrong things. Sometimes we can want it for the wrong reason. Imagine wanting all for someone else for their best. Well, God wants it all. God wants our best. And what he wants is our heart. Because God knows the difference between a heart, a given heart, a loving heart, an unconditional heart. When you can give God all your heart, he knows what it's worth. He knows what you can do with that heart. He knows the per per person that you're capable of being. And if we don't even know that within ourselves, again, let's look at Jesus and let's look at God. He gave it all to us. Jesus gave it all for us. And when we think about that and how him giving himself in all, how much it not only benefited us, but it benefited all those amongst us as believers and saints, how much it has benefited the world. 
Why? Because he gave it all. So imagine if we give all our all to God. He wants it. He commands it. He deserves it. He doesn't need it, but he wants it. Many times our love for something or someone is determined by its value to us or how much we appreciate it. In other words, our love can be determined by how we feel, our emotions, and even our attitudes. Loving God with our whole heart is the key to everything in life because your relationship with God affects everything and everyone in your life. Now, we as believers recognize that we wouldn't have anything or be anything without God. Who we are today is because of God. And the things that we lack of many times is because of our own choices and decisions. So if everything that we do determines our relationship with God, and if we give him our all, that's how much more that our life can be. But when we withhold our best, when we don't give him our all, and our life and our path that we're on, and the choices and decisions that we make, the blessings that we have and the outcome from those decisions are based on our relationship with God, what do we think will happen when we don't give God our all? When we're in situations, trials and tribulations sometimes, when our life is in turmoil, when the choices that we make and the consequences we go through, sometimes we need to ask ourselves, am I here because I'm not giving my all? Well, let's look at that. See, what does that look like, giving your all? Turn with me to the uh, book of Luke, chapter 7, please. Again, hold your finger at Corinthians, but... Book of Luke, chapter 7. I'll be reading verses 36 through 47. Remember, God wants it all. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. And even some of the passages say all your strength, your heart. And in the Jewish uh, 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 understanding, that heart was just not an emotion, it was an understanding understanding of your heart and what you think and the choices that you make. Again, that's the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 47. And the word says as such, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil now when the Pharisee who has invited him saw this he spoke to himself saying this man if he were a prophet would know who what man of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner and Jesus answered and said to him Simon I have something to say to you so he said teacher say it there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denaro and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom you forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head and my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with, the fra with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same one loves little. What we see here in this passage is a thankful heart. This woman gave it all. She gave it all to God through the anointing of the oil, her shedding of her tears, the kissing of her feet. She gave it to all because she had a thankful heart. We are commanded to love God with our whole heart. That is because it is possible to love God with only a part of your heart. It is impossible to love God with only a part of your heart. Just like the church can be divided, just like our knowledge and understanding can be divided between the world's wisdom and God's wisdom, our heart also can be divided. It is possible to love God with only part of your heart. It is a consequence of not giving him your all. It's only when you are thankful with your whole heart that you are able to love him with your whole heart. That means you must be thankful for everything in your life, your past, your present. Thankfulness is a gauge that measures our heart condition. 
It reveals anything which is blocking your love for God. Thankfulness to God is an indication of a heart that has a right standing before God. Out of a thankful heart flows expressions of love to God. This includes praise, worship, and obedience. A thankful heart and recognizing that where you were, where you could have been. The scripture tells us that this woman and the Pharisee who was a religious man said this woman was a sinner. If he was truly a prophet, meaning if he understood this woman, if he knew who she really was, and a woman that was kissing and doing all these things, he would not allow her to do this. But Jesus being who he is, being a loving, kind God, being one of unconditional love, a representation of agape love with no hidden agenda, he saw this woman, he saw her heart. A thankfulness that she recognized when she encountered Jesus Christ that she poured her heart out to him. She had so much sin within her life. She had so much sorrow in her heart that all she can do was shed the tears and be thankful that as I approach this God, this holy God, and the scripture does not tell us how she knew, but she knew. And what she could do is nothing else but to show that. And that's what God wants from us. When he says, I want all, I want it all, your whole heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your body, all of your strength. When we have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with God that's based on thankfulness of what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us, that's us giving our all from him, for him, to him. Because there's thankfulness in there. This is what? To whom much is forgiven, the more we're forgiven, the more we have to show that thankfulness. Now, I'm not telling us to go out here and do some wrong things so we have more to be forgiven. But when you truly understand who you are in the life that you have lived and the battle that we continue to have in these fleshly bodies until we go on to glory, when we recognize that we're still not perfect, that we're still fighting with this thing and we're still trying to develop into the holiness that Jesus Christ has given us, but yet he still continues to forgive us when we have a repentant heart. When we confess those sins and recognize that, Lord, I should not have had that thought. Or I should not have said that thing out my mouth. Or I should not have acted that certain way. And then when he comforts us and knows that because our heart was right and we really feel uh, bad about what we did and confess that sin, that it's a thankfulness and understanding that God has forgiven me. When he blesses us and continue to bless us in our life, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whether it's health-wise, whether he blesses our family, or even when he chastises us and teaches us something, and you got a true heart of thankfulness, you recognize, God, thank you for teaching me that. Because if I didn't know that, what other choices and decisions I would have made? See, all of us are under here and amongst us that recognize as parents. You know, it's amazing how God works in the knowledge that he's given us. Before we be probably became parents or adults, especially not knowing them in the Christ, that we recognize God, our Father, wanted us to live a certain life. I can speak for myself. As I was growing up as a young kid and being told the word of God, one of the things I thought about, what conclusion I came to being young, naive, and stupid, that God just don't want you to have no fun. Everything that I wanted to do, you should not do. You know, don't do this, don't do that. And I was like, man, God just don't want it. And I laughed at those that were trying to live their life because I thought they was just nerds, you know, no fun. No, I got, that's, again, leaning on my own understanding, what I thought was right. But as I got older, as I gave my life to Christ, and as he saved me, thankfully, especially when you become parents, you recognize all that time God was trying to be your father. He was trying to guide you. He was trying to mold you. He was trying to teach you. He was trying to keep you from the consequences that you wanted to be a part of so bad. He tried to keep you from those areas of life that you thought you was missing out on, those things that you need to be a part of, because he knew later on that you'd be knocking on his door, praying to him, say, Lord, get me out of this mess. And it's the same way many times we look at our kids. We try to comfort them, teach them, support them, and tell them what we know that they need to understand, that if they don't follow this path, the destruction that can probably be a part of their life, but we, sometimes we can see the faith, their faces, not only children, grown men, grown women, grown adults, but you're just looking at them just like God looks at you, trying to keep you from the consequences, the choices, the decisions, that one day that you're going to fall upon your knees and call for him. But thank God for those situations. Because it's through those situations that when God brings us to that gives you a thankful heart. Just as this woman was sitting here shedding the tears. 
being a descendant, it doesn't tell us all about her life and sin. But I can imagine, I can imagine from my own experiences when I see how God has touched me and do things in my life and has blessed me and praise God for those things, I can't help but look back and see where I come from. The situation I put myself in and the only way I got out of them was God and I didn't even know it at the time. Sometimes I thought I was smarter than everybody else. But when it looks back and I say, oh, my God, when I talk to old friends or friends I grew up with and God, uh, sorry for their loss, but so many of them are in jail now or dead. I can't help but sit there and look at it and say, why me? And there was certainly nothing that I'd done, but it was God's grace. Thank God that I was running down that same road that many of them and he took me off the path. Thank God that I had people that was uh, 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 looking out for me, even when I didn't know they were looking out for me, teaching me wisdom and understanding of you need to turn your ways around. You need to stop doing the things you're doing. But still didn't recognize that God was using those people to speak through and give me wisdom. But again, it's not till you come through and you understand through the word of God that he enlightens you. I understand who you are, that you sit there and say, thank God. And that's why we praise God. That's why we should praise God. That's why we should worship God. Sometimes we may look at other people and wonder, does it take all that? Somebody may, does it take all that? Is that necessary? Is that true? Well, unless you walk the walk that person has done, unless you've been in a situation that they've been shipped in, and unless they've been delivered from their circumstances, you will never understand why they shed the tears they do, why they shout the way that they shout, because they know how God has brought them and delivered them from they know the jail cell that they were in and should have been in. They know the death coffin that they may have been in. They know the disease that they were healed from. They know the selfishness of their own heart that God had to deliver them from, to redeem them. When you have a true encounter with Jesus, it causes a reaction in your heart. A reaction, a true encounter. That's what this woman had. This woman with the oil at the Pharisee's house, she had an encounter with Jesus. She knew he, she was going to be at the man's house. He knew he was going to be at the table. She purposely sought out after him. Somewhere she heard that Jesus was going to be at this man's house. Somewhere she heard about Jesus being in town. No different than any people that's out in the community. On our jobs, we do whatever we can to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we call to be. But God's word is going out. Whether it's through a TV commercial of a church, whether it's on a billboard, whether it's on a poster, God's word is going out. He uses whom he chooses to use. He can use us just as easy he can use a track. But when this, Jesus, when this person had an encounter, and when someone has an encounter with God and his word, it causes them to have a reaction. The encounter, even from the natural sinful man, he has the ability, the natural man still has the ability to show love. He still has the ability to show thankfulness. It's a part of his moral attributes. He has, gets that from God. When we create in God's image, he gives us the ability to love, to be thankful. But what the problem happens many times, when someone encounters Jesus Christ, it causes a reaction, whether you believe it or not believe it, whether you accept it or don't accept it, whether you even meditate or think about that word or don't. God says, I want it all. I want your whole heart. Well, what happens sometimes in an unbeliever, it may have happened to us before we finally gave our life to Christ, that God drew us in, is to have the ability to harden our hearts. When you encounter it with a question, when you encounter it with the word of God, when you encounter it with your sin, when you encounter it with a moral decision, right and wrong, God has put in our hearts and he put in the laws. That's why the governing body is in the place that it is. As bad as the government and the decisions they make, the government was put here for God. One of the things they do is put, say, like a traffic stop. If you go through it, you broke the law, you can pay a fine. Well, you don't do it. Man has that within him, right or wrong. That, that's no different than God's word. We know right or wrong. God's word has been put out there for man to understand this. They don't know the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, but that's why the Holy Spirit is given to man, even our natural man, to convict him of his sins. So when the man, unnatural, the natural man is encountered by Jesus Christ and he is encountered of how he should live his life and whether he live his life right or wrong, he can be thankful and understanding that, you know, I understand that I have sinned or he can harden his heart and reject the word of God all completely. He has that choice. 
That's why God tells us in Romans 1 that man is without an excuse. That if we look upon creation, the heavens and the earth, it declares his glory. That it gives them an opportunity to understand there is a creator. They may not understand why he created it. They may not understand how God created it. But what man has a tendency to do is say yes and accept it or deny it and harden his heart. Matthew 13, 14, 5 says, hearing you will hear. And, not, and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of the people have grown dull their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them a hardened heart this is what this telling you they, they have eyes but yet can't see hears but can't understand God is to unless they turn their heart unless they stop hardening their heart and have a thankful heart and recognize right and wrong. God will not, God tries to convict them with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works in a natural man by convicting their, of their sins, but the natural man also has the ability to harden his heart, therefore avoiding any conviction. When he hardens his heart, he avoids yielding to the understanding of his wrongdoing, his sinful nature. As believers, we have the ability to harden our hearts as well. This is when we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to comfort us, encourage us, lead us, guide us, and bring all things back to remembrance. Sometimes God may want us to do something, but because of our lack of understanding or disobedience, we harden our hearts because we do not understand what God is doing in our life. Look at the example of Jonah when God had called him to go to Nineveh. Jonah hated the Ninevites. God had a plan for his life. God had a plan for the Ninevites. But yet Jonah, because of his disregard for them, his dislike for them, he went the other direction. Now imagine if Jonah at the time would have loved God with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, and all his strength. By giving God all his, his whole heart, he would have recognized through that relationship that God has a plan. God has a benefit for others. God has a blessing for me. Yes, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but because I love God so much, I'm willing to do this for him. That's the example that Jesus Christ gave us. In spite of him knowing he was going to the cross, in spite of him knowing he was going to be persecuted, in spite of him knowing he was going to be ridiculed, spit on, and all the things that he went through, because he gave God his all, he still chose to take that path. But we know what happened with Jonah. He ended up in the belly of the whale for three days. Again, a scripture that we could use today. Even in his disobedience, God got the glory out of it. To use for an example of what it is to give his all and what it means to harden his heart. The father, given the revelation to Jonah, he hardened his heart and grieved God. Jesus Christ walked this earth, given revelation of who the God father was. Man of, of hardened their hearts, grieved Jesus, disobeyed. Why? Because they could do that. That's that choice. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, they had that choice. God said, don't touch of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Holy Spirit is given to you and I. The fullness of spirit can dwell rich in each and every one of us as believers, but yet we can still harden our heart and grieve him. Why? Because we lack understanding of what God is trying to do in our life, the purpose that he's working in our lives. Bring God the glory. He wants it all. He deserves it all. This is why we have to watch out for false doctrines, divisions in the church, yielding to worldly wisdom because of these things we can misunderstand what God wants to do in our lives the church and the unbelievers turn back to me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where we first started can we back at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as I'm finishing up and we'll be reading verses 9 through 12 again 1 Corinthians chapter 2 Verses 9 through 12, and the word says as such. Again, we've quoted the Old Testament prophesies about this. Jesus has spoken this in the book of Matthew. Here's Paul again is saying the same thing. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who was from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. 
The flesh does not understand the things which God has prepared for those who love him. When we harden our hearts, we are, are not yielding to the spirit of God. When we do not yield to the spirit of God, we cannot understand the things of God, what he wants us to do, where he's leading us. When we do not allow God to lead us and give us understanding, we can make bad decisions and choices. When we make bad decisions and choices, we can cause consequences in our lives, heartache and sorrow. When we have sorrow in our heart, it keeps us from being thankful for what God has done and is doing in our lives. When we are not thankful, we do not love God with all our hearts, and we can miss out on the things that God has prepared for us. Verse 9 says, finishes off, said, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Before the foundation of the world, this was already done. For those who love him, those that are given all to God, their hearts are not divided, but with a thankful heart recognizing that what God has done from some, since the beginning of the world, God has given us what? Grace, mercy, so many blessings before the foundation of the world. For those who loved them, for those who did not harden their heart towards them. When we came to an encounter with Jesus Christ and the sins of the Spirit of convict us of our sins, and we did not harden our heart but listen, yielded, just like the woman in the, uh, with the alabaster oil, just like so many others, it was God that convicted us of that Spirit and drew us in. And then we learned about God's desire for our lives. Then we learned about Jesus Christ. But this was given, this blessing was given way before the foundation of the world. I have not seen, meaning the flesh has not seen through the eyes or understand through the ears of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. It can be only given through the spirit of God. That's, again, why we cannot fall to false worship, false doctrine, and godly, worldly wisdom. Because when we do that, and especially if we yield to a man that's through the fest that doesn't have the spirit of God, then we can miss out on the blessing that God has placed upon us. Amen. It only comes through the spirit of God and from a thankful heart. One of the things uh, about a month and a half ago, and I may be rehashing this or some that want to forget the Ravens Super Bowl season, you know, uh, uh, like them or dislike them, understand them or dis not understand them. I'm thinking about Ray Lewis. And Ray Lewis, ever since the time that he announced his uh, retirement this year, he was a media magnet. The cameras was up front of him, asked him all types of questions. But as God had took him through the journey of his basketball career, even his ending season, and as the Ravens won, football, I'm sorry, <laughs> as the, <laughs> the football season that was ending, the cameras was right there in front of him. And as he spoke, I believe, from his heart, or only God knows, but he revealed the thankful heart that God has given him of the life that he lived. Now, who am I? I don't know if he's saved. All I'm doing, I know is what that man is confessing with his heart. Liking him about what he's done, but everybody here, or at least understand Ray Lewis and his past, know the man has a past. He has a history. He's a confessing sinner. He recognized that he was a sinner. And if you know anything about him, and I don't know all the history, but I know that I don't believe the man was ever married, but yet he got five kids at least. And I'm not sure if they're all by different women, but we know the man was a sinner. He confessed his faults of being a sinner. We know the man was even charged for double homicide. You know, whether he did it or not, I don't know. God will convict him and has convicted him, and he's going to uh, still have to deal with anything he's done. But yet the man has spoken before millions of people of the thankful heart. And sometimes we can question a person and their motives and say, does it really take all that? You know, is he really sincere? I have many people in my job that still won't let the past go about what he was convicted of. Michael Vick with the dogs. And yes, they did some dirty stuff some rotten stuff, but through that rottenness of Lisa Ray Lewis and confessing that what God has delivered him from and the thankfulness that God has took that lifestyle from him, those choices he made, in spite of all the things that he done wrong that he could have been sitting in jail somewhere, he could have been murdered himself, in spite of out here sowing his seeds everywhere, he still has a relationship with his kids and he's given God all the glory. And while he was doing this, God kept putting the camera right up front of him. I ain't saying the Ravens won because God had blessed them with it, but God could have kept them from it if he chose to or not. But all I know was every time they won, this man was confessing. He had a thankful heart. Even if the man was acting, I've never seen no actors on TV cry as much as he did. i never seen a performance like that if it was a fake performance. Me personally, I don't believe it was. 
Because the things I know of him or understood in life that he lived, he's confessing not to live their life anymore. Just like we, as believers, we can only tell people what we've been through. We share our testimony with people every day, hopefully in an opportunity. And when people wonder, why are you this way, does it take all that? Do you need for you to say God all the time? Do you need for you to, yeah, but did God really help you that? But when you share your testimony of where you've been at, what God has brought you through, and they may say it don't take all that, but that's because they haven't been through what you've been through. Just like the Pharisee didn't understand as woman why I took all that for her to shed her tears, to kiss Jesus' feet, and to wipe her hair. It didn't take all that in his mindset for to spend this alabaster oil that could have been used for the poor. In his mind, because he was in darkness, he didn't understand. He hardened his heart. They both had an encounter with Jesus Christ at the same time. The woman recognized her sins. The man was a religious man and recognized it doesn't take all that. You're going to always have people that are looking on the outside in, one that doesn't really take all that. But don't ever let them discourage you because God wants it all. He wants it all. He deserves it all. And we should want to give him it all. But we got to make sure our heart isn't divided. We got to make sure that we're not loving him with an emotional heart. Only seeing the value in, the, in the, uh, uh, what he brings to our life. Because if that's the case, when God stopped blessing us, when he stopped listening to our prayer, when he takes us through trials and tribulations, guess what? Where's our love for God then? That's why we have so many people with hardened hearts that they won't step foot in the church, that they don't want to hear the word of God because they blame God for the things that's going on in their life. You hear many times if there was truly a God, would he allow the world to live the way it does? Would they allow these kids up in a new town to be killed the way they were killed? Because their heart is hardened. Any time the mere fact that someone says you ask a person what do they think about God and they mention God, they know God exists. They may not know everything about him. For someone to say God does not exist, you had to think that he does exist first. Unless somebody said they say, who's that? I never heard that name before. What does that mean? Everyone knows and everyone has some type of encounter. Everyone may be different. It's up to God. But if he wants you to know who he is, he wants himself to make known in your life, he can do that. But we have the ability to harden our hearts. But we're not to harden our hearts. And it does take all that. It takes all that because we have all that within us to praise God and be thankful for that, all that he's given us. But others may not see it. For those who love him, for those who love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, the things that he has for you, the things that he has prepared for you. And one of those things that we know is he's prepared. Jesus went home to prepare a place for you, for his believers. Heaven, glory, no more death, no more sorrow, no more weakness, no more suffering for those who love him. Do not harden your heart today. For now is the point of time for you to give your heart to Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do come before your throne of grace once again, Lord. Praising your holy and righteous name, Father. Praying that your word had went out, Father God, and it did not fall on deaf ear. As the soul went out, the soul sees some fell on good soil, some fell upon weeds, some fell upon thorns, Father God. But I pray that you, being a farmer, that you are the great farmer, that only you can prep the soil in people's hearts, Father God. I pray that you plant the fertilizer, the best fertilizer that only can come from you, Father God. All we can do is sow the seed, Father God. Someone else may have to water, but it's only you that can give the increase. So I pray if that person is at the sound of my voice that you give the increase, Father God. That they look at themselves, Father God, and even now question, am I hardening my heart against God? Am I withstanding something, an opportunity that's given to me that may not be given again? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you search out amongst the pews. Look at those that belong to you and those that don't and the pardon of their sins. And forgive us all, Father God that I pray that this person would be able to confess their faults, confess their sins, that recognize that the opportunity has been given to them many times, and yet they may have hardened their hearts. But today is the appointed time, and tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So if it's your will, Father God, if it's your desire, 
you will have that person to come forward or they will talk to you amongst themselves father god but they need the church home father god the word says that they will not understand unless it's taught unless it's teach unless it's preached unless it's proclaimed and you send out teachers for that reason father god so have your way in this branch of zion for your glory and honor in jesus name i do pray as we have spoken if there's anyone at the sound of my voice they have not taken advantage of the opportunity before when the call of salvation was given. When someone had preached and proclaimed the gospel to them. Whether it was on a street corner, whether it was in a church, whether it was just looking at a track. That God's word was given to you. And you didn't take advantage of the opportunity. And if you want to do that at this time, you truly may do that. So if there's anyone that does not know Jesus Christ and the pardon of their sins and would like salvation... They'd like to see what he has prepared for those who love him. You may come forward at this time. No one's watching. No one's certainly judging. We all just praying that this opportunity that you take advantage of it. it seems that everyone has what they need. And that we all are confessing with our mouth and our hearts that we are born again believers. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And also at this time if there's anyone that want to come forth and join us here at Man of Bible Baptist Church. It may come forth at that time as well. Again, we all have that what we need to thank God, walk with the King, and let us look to be dismissed. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.